have a presentation for uh, turf grass in Tennessee. And um, there was a lot of detail in here, so some of it I'm going to go through um, quickly, but the detail will be available um, when you get the uh, PowerPoint um, available on the Google Drive. So the um, origins of um, turf lawns started way back in Europe um, when the, the elite had castles and they wanted to have clear grounds around the castle so that the soldiers that were protecting the castles had clear view of any enemies that would be um, approaching. Um, and the lawns became a status symbol for um, aristocracy simply because of the amount of land you needed. Um, but as people moved to Tennessee, the lawns looked more like this than they did in uh, Europe <laughs> for the aristocracy. And so people um, had to start spending a lot of time and money and effort to um, get the lawns to look the way they wanted. Um, Lawns in the United States are actually the fifth largest crop now in acreage after corn, soybeans, wheat, and hay. And the ironic thing is humans don't eat the grass. Um, the primary purpose really is just to make us look good and feel good about ourselves. Um, the lawns are very time consuming and can be expensive. They have to be cultivated, watered, mowed, and repaired. There is some utility you know, for grass. Um, it stabilizes the soil, it reduces erosion. It's more temperate than hard surfaces like parking lots and uh, pavement and driveways and sidewalks. And as a living plant, it helps remove toxic substances from uh, the environment, it reduces CO2, increases oxygen. It um, enhances the landscape. And when it's used for sports, it reduces um, injuries as opposed to playing on a solid surface. Tennessee uh, lies in a transition climate zone, um, which means we're kind of in between the, the warm northern areas and the, uh, the, the dark to cold northern areas and the warmer tropical regions to the south of us. So it's kind of a difficult region to grow grass in because there's different grass types that are suited for cooler environments and warmer environments. And to be successful here, you really want to pick the right type of grass um, to have it thrive in this area without doing a lot of extra work. You can see on this map, um, kind of the uh, tan area is the transition zone. It's a pretty big zone, but Tennessee falls right in the center of it. And there's a big discrepancy between Northeast Tennessee and Southwest Tennessee as far as the climate. So you wanna be careful with the um, variety of grass that you're going to choose if you have a choice. Um, basically there are two types, there's cool season and warm season types. And the cool season um, types of grass really thrive between 60 and 75 degrees and they do best in the spring and the fall. They need regular rain during the summertime or they'll go dormant. And just because they go dormant and turn that brown color doesn't mean they're dead, but it is the plant's just natural defense against not having moisture in the extreme heat. Um, planting uh, the grass is best between 68 and 86 degrees, and you want to do it in the fall. September and October are the best times. Um, if you plant fescues or bluegrass in the spring, they'll come up, they'll be nice and green, but as soon as you get the hot summer sun and limited rainfall of the summer, um, in this case, if it's new grass, they'll probably die. The roots haven't really established themselves enough to survive the uh, summer temperatures. The warm season type, uh, types have a tropical origin and they do best in the late spring and summertime. They prefer the higher temperatures, 65 to 90 degrees, and their planting time would be um, late spring and early summer. You can see from this chart, kind of the opposite growth patterns between the cool season grass and the warm season. The cool season grass peaks during the spring, kind of slows down during the summer, and then 
will peak again in the fall where the warm season grasses take much longer to come to life during the springtime. But once it gets warm, these things will take off and then they'll be the first ones to slowly um, go dormant and turn brown in the fall. The cool season types of grasses that um, you're probably familiar with are the tall fescues, fine fescues, Kentucky bluegrass, perennial ryegrass, and annual ryegrass. The warm season types are the Bermuda grass, zoysia, centipede grass, and St. Augustine grass. And I have some details on each one of these types of grasses, um, but the tall seed, the uh, tall fescues, it's a bunch type species. It's got wide leaves and deep roots. Um, it grows best in moist and fertile soils. It spreads laterally with tillers and rhizomes, and it's got excellent heat and drought tolerance. Again, it, it will go dormant in extreme um, climates, but that doesn't mean it's dead. Once it's established, um, it will survive the, uh, the summers in uh, the Tennessee area. Um, you may need to have to use pesticides to control um, some funguses and um, pests. Fine fescues um, or another cool season type. Again, it's a bunch of species. It's deeply rooted. It's got a more upright, um, strong uh, turf than the uh, fescue. It doesn't have stolons or rhizomes, which makes it um, kind of a poor choice if you're gonna have a lot of activity on the lawn. Um, you certainly wouldn't use it for any kind of a sports field or if you have a lot of kids on your lawn playing, you know, constantly. It just doesn't stand up as well to the traffic. It will go dormant during the hot, dry summer months. It's um, a prone to, uh, more prone to disease during the hot, wet weather. And you can get a lot of thatch from this. Hard fescue, it's a non-creeping species, similar to the sheep fescue. The leaves are a darker green, they're tougher and wider. It's got very shallow roots, which makes it less tolerant to uh, drought. Um, but it is um, heat tolerant and it'll remain green during the uh, hot summer. Sheep fescue is another bunch type species for cool season, very stiff and upright leaves. Um, once you get this established, it doesn't require um, maintenance. It can tolerate the low temperatures um, that we get here in the, the late fall and winter seasons. Um, so it'll stay green the longest. Um, and it grows well in infertile, acidic, or sandy, gravelly soils. Bermuda grass is uh, one of the warm seasons types. This is a very aggressive, uh, low growing, and it's um, very persistent. They use it um, for uh, sod farming in a lot of cases. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> it spreads both above, above the ground with stolons and below the ground with rhizomes. Um, grows best in full sun. Um, and it doesn't really like shade. Um, the leaves uh, of this will turn brown and you can notice this on lawns around here. It's, it's very predominant um, during the winter time where you just see somebody that looks like all they have is uh, straw on their lawn. It is resistant to weed invasion and um, doesn't do very well in infertile or poorly drained soil. Soyser, it's another warm season grass. It's native to Australia, New Zealand, Asia, um, where the climate and rainfall vary greatly, which is similar to our area. It's a slower growing um, grass, um, but once it's established, it'll form a very dense uniform turf. Um, <clears throat> it takes time for this to get established um, because it's a slow growing um, species, but um, after a couple of years, you will have a very solid turf on the lawn. Um, but it also, because it's a very tough um, growing grass, low growing, um, it, it can be more difficult to mow. Um, it's excellent as far as drought and heat tolerance. Um, but if you drive your car across the lawn, and you're one of those people that likes to park your car on the front lawn, it doesn't do well with injury. It, again, because it's slow growing, it's gonna take a while to um, recover from injury. Centipede grass is another example of a warm season grass. Um, this doesn't require very much fertilization. Um, again, it's slow to spread and get established. Doesn't require a lot of maintenance once it is established. 
um, but it does tolerate drought and the heat in this area. Um, all the turf grasses um, have a kind of a layered structure. Um, <clears throat> as it grows, it'll produce new roots, leaves and stems. Um, the older um, roots and shoots kind of die off and um, become energy or uh, food for uh, soil organisms. Um, as it grows, um, and if, if it grows at an unfavorable uh, rate, um, you'll get a lot of what's called thatch. That's that, the part of the grass that gets sloughed off. Um, some thatch is good for the lawn. Um, it's kind of a spongy, resilient layer between the soil and the, the grass, but uh, too much thatch will be um, detrimental to the lawn. It actually can prevent uh, moisture from getting to the soil. This is a picture of the, the kind of layered structure of the grass, showing the thatch layer, the crown of the grass, and the grass blades. Um, the crown is where the, um, the, the uh, grass shoots of the um, tillers meet the root systems. The rhizomes are one of the ways that some of these grasses will spread and they um, extend out beneath the ground. Um, stolons are parts of um, grass from certain types that will spread above the ground. So you can actually see them creeping ac across and um, producing new plants. And tillers are the above ground branch of a plant. Um, <clears throat> this is a picture of those root components. Now, depending on the type of grass, some of them will have stolons, some will have rhizomes, um, others won't. It depends, again, on, on the type that you've planted. And this is another example of um, the grass structures. Um, again, some of the grasses will propagate very quickly. Others take, um, can take a couple of years to establish and fill in. The growth habits of grass, the fescues are a bunch type. Um, so are the rye grasses. Um, an example of a grass with rhizomes is Kentucky bluegrass. The um, warm season grasses like centipede grass and St. Augustine grass have stolons. And the Bermuda and zoysia grasses have both rhizomes and stolons. For a healthy turf, you need the basics that we've talked about over and over, light, temperature, and water. Um, it's just like any other plant. Um, and all of those components are necessary. Um, and yes, you know, you can have a lawn that's got shade. You can have um, a lawn in a place where there's not ideal temperatures, either a very cold winter or a very hot summer. Um, you can have droughts. Um, and there are ways of dealing that uh, with those conditions with your lawn. But you generally want to have the right blend of these three things to have a successful lawn without a lot of extra work. Um, carbon dioxide is, is, again, a component that any plant um, with photosynthesis needs. And the nutrition is, again, the, a, a lot of the um, basic nutrients of the soil are generally um, okay. But if you have a deficiency in the soil, you definitely want to have um, some extra nitrogen um, to keep that green color. Grasses can be planted in several different ways and it depends on the type of grass. I'm not gonna go through each one of these, but um, as you can see, a lot of them can be seeded. Um, some can be are good to be rolled out from sod. Um, sod is much more expensive than seed. Um, and I will say if you're doing seed, you wanna pay the extra money to get a good quality seed. Um, there are a lot of differences. There's a lot of um, the lower quality seeds will have more contamination and weed content. Um, there are seeds that they now package with coatings um, that provide some um, moisture and nutrients for the seed when it germinates. But again, those coatings take up space. So when you buy a bag of grass seed and the seed is coated, you're going to get much less seed for the, for the price that you're paying. Um, so if you're doing a large area, that's probably not what you want to do. Um, some grass can be seeded from uh, plugs or sprigs. A plug is actually a complete plant that they would put in the ground. 
Um, a sprig is either a portion of a, a stone or a rhizome um, that, that's used. You want to sow in fertile soil if you <coughs> have the option of being able to do this from scratch and um, can work the ground. You want it to be, you know, level. You want it to be fairly firm. You don't want it that fluffy. So if you, you step in the soil, your footprint shouldn't be more than an inch deep. And if you're going to cover the seeds, um, you want to try and use um, straw mulch, especially um, if you're planting it later in the year, you can probably get away without that, but it helps with retain the moisture. Um, and as far as maintenance fertilization, um, it depends on the season um, as far as uh, how much you want to use and the type that you want to use. And I have a list here of the different types of grass and the requirements. And again, I won't go through all the details, but it kind of shows you um, the amounts that you might need for a typical um, lawn with these different types of grasses. Um, I have a couple of, there's four different plans here to give you a sense of if you wanted a high intensity fertilization plan, which means, you, you, you know, you're really fastidious about the lawn. You want this to look better than all your neighbors. That would be this kind of a plan where you're fertilizing maybe four or five times a year. And it shows you the rates that you want to use at the different types of year. Um, again, this is another example of the low intensity plan where you're just kind of doing the bare minimum to keep the grass healthy, but it's twice a year. And again, the ratios of the fertilizer you want to use. Um, this is another example of a high intensity for Bermuda grass as opposed to a low intensity for the same kind of grass. Um, mowing is important. Um, it, the plant grows from the, um, the base. So when you're cutting off the tips of the grass, it really doesn't impact the growth of the plant. That's why these can be routinely mowed twice a week, once a week, without harming the plant. But it is important to mow on a regular basis. You never want to mow more than a third of the, the grass blade off at any given time. Um, you definitely want to use sharp mowing blades. If you're using dull blades, it tends to rip the grass rather than cut it, which leaves shredded ends. That allows for um, fungus and in infections to you know, invade your lawn. Um, this is a, a, a detail for the different types of grass as to how you want to cut the height that it should be depending on the season. Generally in the summer, you want it to be taller to protect it, you know, maintain more moisture in the plant. And also aesthetically, if you leave the, uh, the blades of the grass longer, you will have more green on your lawn even during times of stress when the lawn is naturally going to um, start to go dormant. Insects, there's a whole range of bugs out there uh, that are going to compete with your attempts to have the perfect lawn. Um, but again, the, the best thing that you can do is have a healthy lawn. Um, you're going to have some pests, there's going to be things that attack it, but if the lawn is healthy, um, it will survive most of the pest damage. But pests can be controlled with insecticides, so you want to kind of balance um, the kind of lawn that you're looking for with just, you know, an eco-friendly approach. And this is a list of some of the insects that are out there. Um, <clears throat> and they will attack grasses, either from the plant blades themselves to the roots underneath. Um, and this goes into some details where if you're saying, you know, I saw this grub in, the, in my lawn when I was digging, is that bad? Well, this gives you a sense of, you know, a threshold of what would be acceptable for a lawn and at what point you might want to consider um, taking action to treat the lawn with some chemicals to reduce it. So there's a way to, you know, sample a, a square foot section of your grass and given on the type of pest that you have, what would be an acceptable number in that area and at what point should you consider, you know, using uh, pesticides. Um, again, this is just more details on that. Um, I will stress that if you're using pesticides, read the labels on the packages. Don't buy something that's going to kill more than what you're intending to. Use only the quantities that you want. Be careful where you apply it. Um, you certainly don't want it in areas that have a lot of runoff or um, drainage or in your streams. Um, 
there's different kinds. You have um, granules that, that can be put down that are used dry. You have powders that can be wetted. There's liquid forms. Um, and <coughs> again, read the labels. There's many products out there. You want to get the thing that's specific to the problem you have. Um, diseases are similar to um, insects and pests. Um, there's a wide variety of diseases that can affect the lawn. And I'll say it again, the most important thing for disease control is similar to pest control, is have a healthy lawn. Um, if you manage the grass properly and you follow all of the other guidelines, um, chances are, even though you may have some disease, it's not going to be um, bad enough that you're going to have to take you know, action and starting applying um, chemicals. But if it does get that way, um, the first thing you really want to be able to do is determine uh, what the, uh, the disease is. And there are um, two types of um, fungicides for diseases. There's a preventative control, which you really want to do in heading off something before it occurs. Um, the other thing is, if you do have an occurrence of disease, you've treated it, there's a good chance the following year that might come back again. So this, that's where you would want to use a preventative control. Um, and then there's the curative control where you definitely have a serious problem. You need to do something to kind of contain it before it actually kills the grass. Um, some of these diseases will affect the grass. It won't kill it. Um, but others, if it's not treated, can actually um, do enough damage to the plant where it'll kill the plant. I have a whole um, list of diseases here, um, but you know, just to kind of slowly go through it, you'll see there's a description here of what each disease is and basically how to control it. And some of it, you know, is controllable with chemicals, and other is just um, environmental controls. Um, Algae is one, brown patch is another. Um, they can occur at different times of the season under different weather conditions. Some of them occur more when the cool season, when it's very rainy. Others occur when it's very warm and humid. Um, qualities of the soil can allow the, the uh, diseases to progress. Um, dollar spot is another one. It lists which grasses are subject to these. And some of these solutions to some of these problems is to pick a grass type that is um, resistant to that. And there are, if you read the, um, the labels on a lot of these seed package, they'll tell you which um, diseases that they are uh, designed to resist. Fairy rings is another one um, I know we've talked about in some other uh, presentations. Um, it's basically a fungus that appears with the, you know, in a ring. It could be a large ring. You'll have uh, mushrooms or puffballs that appear, but it doesn't really affect the grass. It just may not be the uh, the site that you want in the middle of your lawn. But there are ways to control it too. But control is actually, you know, not that easy. Some of it are fungicides. Others is just to remove sections of the soil um, that are creating that. Um, Fusarium patch is another problem. Um, too much fertilization can cause this. Um, and again, if, if you have proper maintenance of the lawn and the weather cooperates, a lot of these problems won't be an issue for you. Uh, just go through the rest of these here. Moss is another one. Um, some people like moss, but again, if it's, if it's in the middle of an area, then it usually occurs where there's a, um, a patch that the grass really isn't established, so it could be kind of a bald area in your lawn. The moss will be more than happy, especially if it's um, a shady, moist area to take over that spot. Um, nematodes, um, it, this is another one that um, will affect the uh, roots of the plant. Um, there are grasses that are um, tolerant of this, you know, they're bred to be that way. Um, and there are chemicals that um, can help control this. Powdery mildew is another one. Um, you want, again, you don't want to over fertilize. If you have too much, you know, growth of the grass, that just encourages some of these diseases. Pythium blight is another one. Um, again, 
good soil and air drainage, low um, proper levels of nitrogen, you know, will help control this. Uh, red thread, I'm just gonna go through these quickly. Rust is another one. I have the details in here that when um, this is posted, you'll be able to go back and look at the, the details of this if um, you're interested in trying to identify a problem on your lawn. Slime mold is another one. Um, this is a physical one that, you know, you can probably just remove the, the, uh, the mold because it, it grows on the leaves. It doesn't really affect the grass, but it's just unsightly. Um, dead spot is another one that's kind of limited to Bermuda grass. Again, be careful with how much fertilizer you're using. Striped smut um, affects the uh, bluegrass and tall fescues, and it is a fairly serious disease, but again, proper fertilization, I don't overwater um, the plants. White patch is another one. This is a summary of some of the diseases, the peak times when they occur, and um, some of the factors, the environmental factors that will help, you know, encourage the, the, uh, the disease that you'd want to avoid. Weeds, as, as though pests and uh, funguses weren't enough to make you stay up at night and worry about your grass. There's a whole classification of weeds that love to invade the lawns. Um, there are a lot of people that figure if it's green, I don't mind it growing in the middle of my lawn. Um, there are other people that are just obsessed with anything that doesn't look like a, ba a blade of grass in, in the middle of their uh, turf. Um, so there's a couple of uh, categories for this, uh, the, you know, the classifications. You have broadleaf uh, weeds like uh, wild carrot, chickweed, dandelion, white clover. There are actually grass species that are considered a, um, a weed, Johnson grass, crabgrass, goosegrass. Um, and then there are sedges and kylinga, like yellow nut sedge and green kylinga. Um, and the life cycles of these, some are annuals, like crabgrass, they reproduce from seeds, they complete their uh, life cycle in one year. Um, e each of these would be treated differently because of this. There are biennials that take two years, um, like wild carrot. And then there's a perennial that once it's established, it's just gonna be like your grass. It's gonna come back every year. Um, so you want to identify the, the weed if, um, if you want to be able to control it. Because again, there's a lot of different products out there. So identify the weed. If you're looking for an herbicide to take care of it, it's just like um, the pesticides, read the label. Don't buy something that's you know, not specifically going to deal with the problem you have. Um, and if, again, the label will tell you the best time to apply the uh, herbicide. And there are two main types of herbicides. One is a pre-emergence, and this is the one that's going after the weed seeds that are out there laying on your lawn. You wanna keep them from germinating and growing. Um, that, that's the function of a, a pre-emergence. Um, and again, there's specific times of the year when you'd wanna apply that. This time of year um, is probably the peak season. You should have it down. You really wanna get the pre-emergence um, herbicide out there before temperatures start getting to be uh, 80 degrees or so because once you hit 80 the seeds sprout and pre-emergence uh, won't do anything then it's too late for them. Um, and then there's the post-emergence once the weeds are actively growing that are designed to um, take care of that and there's two types of classifications there's selective and non-selective. Um, so the selective um, herbicide um, is going after specific weeds without harming desired plants. Um, and then that's the uh, non-selective, which kills a much broader range of um, plants. And again, you have to be careful where you use that, but I've seen landscapers come in that when they want to renovate a lawn, will use a non-selective herbicide. They basically want to kill anything that's green and grow. Um, they'll put that down, they'll wait a couple of weeks when everything is dead. They'll till up the soil, they'll put brand new seed down, make sure it's irrigated. And, you know, again, if you properly maintain that, you'll have, you know, a beautiful lawn. So in summary, lawns have to be cultivated. Very rarely will you get a beautiful lawn without doing the work. Um, you have to mow them, got to water them, they've got to be fertilized and weeded. You gotta control the pests. 
Diseases need to be treated if they're prevalent. But most importantly, you want to enjoy your lawn. 